Thank you all for joining and uh, welcome to the webinar Turbocharge MySQL Performance with uh, Flash Storage, jointly hosted by Percona and uh, Viridian Systems. My name is Sridhar Subramanian and I'm the Vice President of Product Marketing and Management at uh, uh, Viridian. I'm joined here by a group of panelists who have had significant experience in the MySQL space in terms of optimizing and delivering very high performance. We are joined by Vadim Chenko, uh, who is the CTO and co-founder of Percona, Baron Schwartz, Chief Performance Architect at Percona, and Sirish Jamte, who is a Global SE Director at Viridan. Before we get started, I'd like to give a very brief introduction uh, to Viridan Systems. The company was founded in 2006. Uh, we are a privately held company, very well funded by leading uh, venture capitalists, such as Sequoia Capital, Globespan Partners, Artiman Ventures, Intel Capital, as well as Cisco. Um, we have over six years of experience developing and delivering enterprise class uh, storage products based on flash technology. Our current generation of flash products is a PCIe SSD um, with both MLC and SLC flash in a low profile form factor. Our key differentiator with respect to the other competing SSD solutions in the marketplace is that we focus on what we call as unconditional sustained performance. And what we mean by unconditional sustained performance is that we deliver very high levels of uh, steady performance across a range of application workloads over time of the usage of this particular product as well as at different levels of capacity utilization. This is in addition to uh, other capabilities such as enterprise class reliability as well as delivering the highest capacity in a very small form factor that is applicable across all kinds of server platforms. I'd like to now turn this over to Baron Schwartz, who will give a brief introduction of Percona. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. It's good to be here today. Um, I am, just for the, for the uh, viewers, I'm in Virginia, and everyone else is out at Viridian Systems headquarters in uh, California. So if you hear a difference in our audio quality, that's, that's why that happens. Percona is a global services company for MySQL users. Uh, we help people succeed with MySQL. That's our sort of our tagline. And we've been in business since 2006. We have about 60 people globally and over 1,200 customers, including some, some of the names that you use every day, such as Alcatel, Lucent, and Nokia. We provide uh, services and products for MySQL users, including consulting, support, training, and engineering for the MySQL server as well as running a series of conferences where we share our knowledge and bring other experts together. Our big conference is upcoming in a couple of weeks. That's Percona Live MySQL Conference and Expo, and you can learn more about that at percona.com slash live. That is the big annual uh, global MySQL conference. Percona is running it for the first time this year instead of O'Reilly. On the product side, we provide Percona Server, which is an enhanced version of MySQL. It's very close. In, uh, in nature to Oracle's version of MySQL, and it's drop-in compatible. Anything that runs on MySQL runs on Percona Server without modification, and vice versa. Anything that runs on Percona Server can be switched back to standard MySQL. And it delivers improvements in three key areas. One is performance, specifically consistency of performance, which is why um, it, it's one of our philosophies that aligns very well with Viridant systems, that performance should not just be fast some of the time, but all of the time. It should be consistent and reliable. Also, uh, transparency. We've added a lot of instrumentation into the server so that you can measure what it does, and operational flexibility so that you can do tasks such as schema changes and restarts and reconfiguration of the server with less downtime, or in some cases, no downtime. We also provide Percona XRDB cluster, which is a uh, synchronously replicated multi-master, right anywhere, no replication delay, high performance um, replication clustering solution for MySQL. Percona Extra Backup, which is the only free and open source non-blocking backup solution for NODB data. Percona Toolkit, which is a series of essential administration tools written in uh, 
for system administrations and, and database administration use. And all of the above are 100% open source and free software, and you can see them and learn more about them and, and several other products as well at percona.com slash software. So with that behind us, uh, let's go ahead and, and get started on today's agenda. Okay. Thank you, Varun. So there are four main uh, topics uh, in today's webinar. The first one is where Baron will talk about the areas in MySQL that could uh, potentially leverage Flash. As we all know, MySQL is the database of choice in the Web2.0 company today. And as companies grow pretty rapidly with a huge explosion in traffic as well as data set sizes, uh, companies do end up facing challenges with respect to I.O. Baron will be talking about what these challenges are and how Flash can uh, help alleviate these challenges, and more specifically, uh, which areas of MySQL could benefit the most by using Flash storage. And once customers have decided to deploy Flash-based storage, there is some level of tuning and optimization that is required on the MySQL side. Vadim will be talking about what these tuning parameters are. And Sirish will be talking about how does one truly go about selecting the best SSD product for a MySQL environment. There are quite a few SSD products based on Flash uh, technology out in the marketplace, and there are quite a few claims with respect to performance. Sirish's uh, I mean, uh, this, excuse me, discussion will be focused on how do you differentiate these performance numbers, and how does one make sure that they have the best performing product for their particular environment. And I will be presenting at the end on uh, the ROI that a, a sample customer actually benefited from when they put in a, a Vinit and PCIe SSD as the primary store for their MySQL workload. So, uh, Baron, you have had a lot of experience in terms of working with customers uh, facing uh, MySQL performance problems. It would be great if you could spend some time talking about what these challenges are, uh, I mean, more specifically related to the I.O. bottlenecks. How does uh, an SSD-based storage system alleviate some of these bottlenecks? And what areas of MySQL would benefit the most by putting in this kind of storage? Exactly, yeah. So at the high level, you could, of course, use flash storage for any system. The question is whether or not you want to or whether or not that system is going to benefit more from flash storage than it might from some other optimization technique or a different kind of hardware or something like that. So we always try and approach things from the high level and figure out uh, which systems actually need flash storage and, and can benefit the most from it. And a few ways that are interesting to look at that is to look at um, uh, which particular types of systems and workloads and data sets tend to suffer a lot when they don't have flash storage. So flash has a couple of interesting properties that matter a lot, um, and they, they matter specifically for MySQL in a couple of dimensions. One of those is fast random reads, and random is key here. Um, standard disks can be configured in a number of different ways. You can put a, a bunch of them together in a good quality RAID controller, and if you give it certain workloads, you can actually get extremely good performance out of it. Specifically for sequential uh, reads and writes, you can get pretty decent performance out of standard disks, and um, they're pretty economical, so there may not be a compelling benefit there. Uh, but on random reads, Flash is pretty much untouchable because uh, you don't have a, a head that has to physically seek across the disk. And this, I, I'm sure a lot of our, our listeners are quite familiar with this, so I won't belabor the point. The other particular area of um, of benefit from using flash storage is getting high write throughput because standard uh, uh, spindle based disks can only get so much write throughput due to a, a variety of limitations such as the interconnect that's used and um, flash specifically PCIe flash can uh, break through some of those bottlenecks and offer much higher write performance so when a when a workload is really highly write bound um, sometimes, no matter how many disks you throw at it, you might not be able to achieve the performance that you need, or at least not in a sustained fashion. Also, uh, Flash offers very low latency for reads and writes, and um, that matters a lot for particular workloads that need uh, very low latency. 
And finally, Flash can offer good concurrency. A disk can only do one thing at a time because the head only moves to one place on the platter and writes or reads one place at a time. But Flash can actually offer concurrency. So where MySQL suffers, in particular, um, on spindle-based disk is with joins, that is with your typical well-designed, well-normalized schema, you're going to have some number of joins. And um, so a, a, a normalized schema requires you typically to read from one table, uh, find some records of interest, and then to look them up typically using an index in another table, and that represents random I.O. And that's going to suffer very badly on Flash. So a properly normalized schema, which is the most economical and um, uh, sensible for developers to work with, turns out not to always be the best scenario for the uh, database administrator to work with. And if you read, for example, High Performance MySQL, our book, we talk a lot about denormalization techniques to get better performance. But it's nice if you don't have to do that, because that adds complexity uh, to your MySQL system. Very large tables is another place where that happens. Um, uh, when a table is just very large and doesn't fit into memory, or the working set of it doesn't fit into memory, that is the, the amount of the table that is accessed frequently, then you have to go to disk, and typically um, when you have a, cached, a partially cached workload and then some portion of it is not cached, the portion that's not cached is going to result in random accesses to the disk, and again, that's what spindle-based disks are not very good at. So the database tends to suffer pretty badly on that as well. And uh, the combination of the two, mixed workloads, can, can really put a dent in your database server's performance uh, because caches don't deal very well with mixed workloads. Caches are, are designed around the principle of locality of reference, either locality of reference in time or in space. In time, we say that something has locality of reference. Um, if we accessed it recently, we're going to be likely to access it again pretty soon. And um, if we access something in space on the, on the surface of the disk, we're likely to access something near it. So that's locality of reference based on space. And if you have a mixed workload, uh, you can violate both of those assumptions that make caches work. And so the, uh, the database server's cache, again, can't satisfy the workload, and it has to go to disk. And that tends to be very, very slow performance. So the typical thing that happens here is that you have some workload that's, uh, let's say, a, a a, a workload that we see a lot would be a kind of a, a web application workload where you have some mixture of reads and writes, probably mostly reads. And um, the caches become warm. That is, they, they sort of reach a steady state where they're satisfying the database's requirements pretty well and performance is pretty good. And then you have something like a, a full table scan that comes in and just blows the caches out. And that full table scan is not going to run again very often, so you've just loaded a bunch of data into the caches that is really not beneficial for anything else. So um, Flash can be beneficial there in alleviating the sort of suffering of, of uh, the mixture of workloads that cache designs can't handle very well. Replication tends to suffer a lot in MySQL uh, for completely different reasons, actually. And that is because replication is single-threaded. Well, that's, that's the primary reason why replication tends to suffer in MySQL. So all of your transactions um, execute concurrently on the master, and then they're actually written in a serial form to the binary log where the, 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 uh, the replica fetches the binary log from the master and then re-executes it to keep its data in sync with the master. But that re-execution process happens in a single thread, no concurrency, unlike the master, which can have lots and lots of concurrency. And that causes it to pay a penalty. It can't do a bunch of things in parallel, so the, act, the, the, uh, the latency of each of the things that it must do to mirror the master's data matters a lot. And it's very, very common and, and quite a serious operational concern in MySQL to deal with replication latency. People go to uh, quite extreme lengths sometimes to try and make sure that their replicas don't get delayed behind the masters because of the, the nature of the single-threadedness of replication. And finally, this is a, a replication is one example of when low latency is actually very beneficial. But there are many other cases where low latency is either beneficial or an absolute requirement for a particular workload. And Flash can help there a lot. Anytime that you have an application that has tight response time constraints or um, a combination of things such as high concurrency, tight response time constraints, and high throughput, for example, you pretty quickly reach the bottleneck on disks there.
So those are some of the uh, places where MySQL tends to suffer, and Flash actually offers us a compelling alternative. So some of the, the options that we can and, and frequently see people trying are buying more memory, and this actually it can be a very beneficial and sensible way to go. You have a, a, a series of three or four things that you could juggle in your database system, your, your key resources, and um, when the database server appears to be bottlenecked on one of them, it might actually just be because it's, it's starved for one of the other resources. So an I.O. bottleneck might actually be because there's a, a, a memory bottleneck. Um, and what appears to be a, a CPU bottleneck can also be a, a memory access bottleneck. So these kinds of things aren't always straightforward to look at. Uh, but particularly, the balance between memory and disk is extremely important. And if you're working set size, which I mentioned earlier, the, the amount of data or the, the set of data that's frequently accessed and needs to be kept in memory for better performance, when that grows larger than the physical memory in the machine and the memory that you've allocated to MySQL's buffers, then you tend to start suffering pretty badly. And you can alleviate this in many cases by simply increasing your memory, and that decreases dramatically the demands that are placed on disk. Um, so more memory can actually be a sensible way to go to, to relieve some of the pressures here. I can mention one very large um, popular photo sharing site. I can't mention it by name, but I, I can just sort of mention it as a case study. Uh, they called us in to ask how they could uh, get more um, efficiency out of their database servers because they have a lot of them. And when you have a lot of them, uh, when you have two or three database servers, 10% improvement is not much, but when you have hundreds or thousands of database servers, 10% is actually worth doing. So we looked at them and um, evaluated the alternatives, and in their particular case, adding more memory was the way to go. Um, so we simply doubled the amount of memory in their, in their systems, which they had plenty of room for, and um, uh, improved their performance dramatically. So more memory is, is, is certainly an option to consider. Investing in a SAN is something else that comes to a lot of people's minds. SANs are um, very nice software, and most people that have them absolutely love them. But they don't tend to solve the kind of performance bottlenecks that we're looking at here. A SAN, in general, uh, regardless of what the SAN manufacturer will tell you, uh, <laughs> they'll all sort of admit, yeah, you know, SANs in general suffer from these things, but we're an exception. Well, that's not really true. I mean, we've we've seen all of the people, uh, the companies that say they are exceptions to the rules, and in general, they're not. A SAN typically for the kinds of, of operations that database servers need, those very low latency random accesses, they tend to suffer even worse than locally attached spindle-based disks. So a SAN can be a solution for a lot of things, but typically not for the kind of, of performance problems that we're talking about addressing here today. The next thing we could look at is sharding, and um, Sharding is an application-based partitioning of your data. We will talk more about that later today. I'll just point out that sharding begins with S and ends with hard. It's very difficult and very, um, very expensive in terms of the application, in terms of the, the development and the environment as a whole, the operational tactics that you have to use to maintain a sharded environment. It's something that we like to avoid when we can by scaling up instead of scaling out to multiple systems. And finally, you can get faster I.O., and that's really what we're talking about today. So Flash is a, sort of the missing link in this uh, um, um, tier of memory access hierarchy. So the CPU has some registers that are local to it, and it can access those registers in a very, very short amount of time. Then you've got uh, a, a cache hierarchy that gets larger and slower. On the, on the chart that we're showing here, the caches get larger as you go to the right, and they get slower and slower as you go to the right. So as you move through DRAM and uh, to spindle-based hard disk drives, you go from nanoseconds to milliseconds, um, and Flash can sit right there in the middle. Flash is sort of the, the uh, can sort of extend your, um, your DRAM's performance um, and fill in the gap between DRAM and hard disk drives. So it's a, it's a very nice place to plug in some faster access storage there. So there's a few different types of flash that we want to talk about. Um, they're not all made equal, and um, other panelists are going to talk quite a bit about this. In fact, they're the ones who build it, so they, they know even more than I do. And the fastest and highest bandwidth is the native PCIe SSDs. 
So those are, are uh, uh, much, they have a, a much higher um, bandwidth to the CPU than some of the things that are uh, physically further distant from the CPU and uh, have uh, lower, uh, higher latencies. So um, moving from left to right, we have PCIe SSDs, we have SATA SSDs, which basically imitate the form factor of a spindle-based disk. And then we have, um, I'm sorry, I skipped one in the middle, but I'm sure you're reading on the slide. So in any case, the point is that we have uh, several different form factors. And as we move from left to right, we typically increase the latency to access that storage, and we decrease the bandwidth, um, the actual uh, amount of the, the throughput that you can get from that storage. So Flash benefits MySQL in, in a few key areas. These are kind of going to be closely related to what I talked about a few minutes ago. Low latency, joins, large tables, all of these things that we talked about a, a minute ago. And there's a few other things that we didn't specifically talk about, which is high concurrency workloads uh, is one of them. And a web application is a typical example. A batch processing system, not so much. In many cases, a batch press processing system runs at concurrency of one. There's only one thing happening at a time. But even batch processes can benefit a lot from, from flash storage because each of those individual, there's, there's typically many, um, uh, many, many operations required for a long-running batch process. And if you make them faster, you make the whole thing faster. And uh, the, the benefits that you might see from considering or, or deploying Flash with MySQL is the avoid the need for sharding. That's a big one. Um, a lot of people over the last few years have kind of taken the shard early, shard often sort of approach, and they advocate it everywhere universally. And I like to tell people, shard when you have to. Do not shard early. <laughs> Do not shard often. It's, uh, it's much more painful. It's, it's never a pleasant experience to shard, and you only uh, I think it's, it's best to do only when it's really needed. So Flash can help you avoid that. And it can help you avoid the, the uh, database denormalization that adds a lot of complexity to pretty much everything in your environment. And this uh, uh, replication lag is another key thing that adds, tends to add a lot of complexity to people's environments because if you're going to do consistent reading and writing from your database and you've got multiple databases, but some of them might be delayed and don't have a consistent up-to-date uh, set of data, there's uh, typically a lot of juggling that has to go on to determine whether it's safe to read from any particular replica or whether it's too delayed to actually be useful in service. So reducing that replication delay can help a lot with that. And uh, there's a few things that you, you, uh, you really need to consider when you make the investment in Flash. Uh, it's not something that you sort of take lightly. You can just plunk in some Flash uh, um, and get benefits from it. But there are definitely better and worse ways to do this. There are ways that you can get a lot more benefit out of Flash, and there are, there are ways that you can um, uh, not get as much out of your investment, frankly. So one of the things that uh, is pretty much required to do is to use a Flash-optimized version of MySQL. MySQL is a mature product at this point, and it was not built with Flash in mind. In fact, there really is not a database on the market that was built with Flash in mind. and um, Standard MySQL doesn't have a lot of the optimizations that we've built into Percona Server, and Vadim will be talking about some of those later. The second thing is that Flash uh, provides, depending on the form factor, a lot of I.O. capacity, and MySQL cannot always make, uh, make use of all of that I.O. capacity. So in some cases, getting the best investment, uh, getting the best return on your investment, might actually mean that you shard and, and consolidate multiple servers onto a single um, set of storage underlying it. So uh, Vadim will also be talking a little bit about that later. And finally, I just want to show you a graph here of what the difference between a, a Flash-optimized version of MySQL and stock MySQL can achieve. And on the bottom, we have the red line, uh, which is standard MySQL 5.5.8. And on the top, we have a blue line that's Percona Server 5.5.7. And the difference here is the optimizations that we've made for Flash. This is running a TPCC-like benchmark. It's, it's not certified TPCC, but it's an identical clone of it. And uh, it's running with a 1,000 warehouses on one of Viridin's devices. And you can see not only do we achieve better throughput, but we achieve much more consistent throughput with Flash-optimized version of MySQL. When you have this, this uh, periodic spikes of uh, 
low throughput and high latency, as you can see on the red line, the database server really only is usable at the bottom of those spikes. You can't achieve the, uh, the peak throughput. You, you can't rely on your database server to, to achieve that predictably and consistently. So um, it's very important to get consistent performance. And with that, I'll turn things over to Vadim to dig into these a little bit more. Thank you, Varun. Um, as uh, Varun had mentioned, once you decide to put uh, flash storage in, in order to get the maximum benefits out of flash, it is recommended that you set the parameters and some of the attributes in a certain way. Vadim has, here has a lot of experience in terms of uh, doing performance benchmarks on uh, different kinds of flash as well as performance tuning on the MySQL side. So Vadim, could you talk to the audience about what are the parameters that truly need to be optimized to get the best out of flash storage? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Frida. Uh, as uh, Baran mentioned, uh, the uh, most important factor to take into account is uh, to have proper uh, MySQL version. I still see a lot of installation of uh, MySQL 5.1 running with the default in a DB storage engine, and this configuration cannot give you all benefits of Flash. The default in a DB storage engine in MySQL 5.1 is uh, too old and has many limitations. My recommendation would be to use MySQL 5.5 or even better Icona Server 5.5. And if uh, by some reason you still need the 5.1 version, you can use Icona Server 5.1. For Kona Server, we did a lot of performance research and optimization to take full advantage of Flash. If you're looking to have best possible performance, I recommend to use the Kona Server. And uh, with running a proper version of MySQL, you can get a, a quite visible significant performance improvement. Like on this graph, you see 5 to 7 performance improvements in my benchmark. Uh, uh, however, uh, real difference uh, depends on uh, many factors. And uh, again, uh, like uh, Baron mentioned, memory is one of them. So real uh, performance uh, difference uh, depends on uh, uh, what is your relation between data and the memory. And our usual recommendation is uh, to fit for active data set in memory. However, it is not always possible to increase memory in, in some cases. One of them I will show later. More memory actually shows worse results. Uh, on this graph, uh, you can see how throughput drops when uh, database size starts to exceed memory size. And in case of spinning disk, the drop is very significant. And it actually can be very painful. Uh, you might see it's very close to a, a exponential drop. And this is one of the biggest performance problems we deal with in our consulting practice. When the data starts to exceed memory, the performance drop can be very significant. And that's why I personally like Flash. The Flash allows you to decrease that effect and decrease it quite visible. And the real actual number depends on your workload and what kind of Flash you have and on performance optimization you have. Uh, the following recommendations are for uh, file tuning. And uh, in each uh, particular case, it uh, might uh, require additional research. In general, it seems that Flash is very effective for random read and write operations. But not all Flash storage uh, uh, handle a sequential input output in efficient way. Uh, to deal with it, you might consider to keep sequential files out of flash. For MySQL, it is an NADB transactional file, MySQL binary logs, NADB system table space. And the uh, second point to keep in mind is that flash uh, uh, often operates with 4K block size. And uh, we need uh, to make efforts to match this block size. So to, for a file system, uh, I recommend to use to use 4K block size. And uh, to get better results, you should use file system without barriers. But you also need to make sure that uh, your flash is able to handle power outage, especially if the drive uses some uh, local cache. 
And the uh, multiple threads is a usual recommendation for any kind of application because flash in general, in especially PCIe base, shows best throughput when we do uh, I/O in multiple threads. And uh, for MySQL users, a Percona server on MySQL 5.5 already uses multiple threads for I/O. On this slide, I put a, a list of uh, parameters specific for Percona server. Using these, uh, you will be able to gain a performance difference that you saw on the uh, last button slide on the Percona server against MySQL. First is the uh, flash neighborhood pages. By default, NADB assumes it still works with spinning disk. And the one of optimization for spinning disk is to write a data sequentially. So idea was uh, was to combine several pages pages into one single write operation, and this is not needed for flash. Actually, it might give totally different effect because MySQL has to perform more operation than it is really needed, and this is kind of premature optimization. In in Percona server, you can enable and disable it. Uh, uh, next parameter is a log block size. By default, in MySQL uses 512 bytes for I/O operations with NADB log files. In Percona server, you can change it to 4K to match internal block of flash. Uh, next parameter is the NADB log file size. Uh, having a big log file size is important for stable performance. In MySQL, there is still limitation for gigabytes or uh, log files, which in some cases might be not enough. And you can uh, use bigger size in a Percona server. And the last parameter I would like to mention is adaptive flashing algorithm. Uh, again, uh, the default default one that comes in MySQL is designed for spinning disk. Using new algorithm in Percona server allows you to achieve stable and predictable performance. You will see it uh, on next slide. Uh, on this slide, I show difference uh, uh, in uh, uh, flash and algorithm and uh, uh, choosing proper MDB log file size. You can see that uh, with a smaller log file size, you have a, a very unstable, very unpredictable performance, and increasing that to eight gigs allows you to get stable line. Uh, uh, let's talk about the multiple instances. Even with all performance improvements we have in Percona Server and all recommendations I gave, uh, MySQL is not able to utilize all throughput that's available. In my experiment, we can see that running several instances on single server may show overall overall better throughput than single MySQL, MySQL instance. This is because MySQL is still not optimal internally. There are a lot of internal locking and contention that does not allow you to fully load your subsystem. Actually, you can see that with more memory we have, you actually get worse throughput for single instance. To decrease internal locking and contention, to put more load on your subsystem, you can run several MySQL instances. It should be not that many, but uh, I think like two, three, or four is a reasonable number. Usually it comes with management overhead, and it may be uh, some complex task to manage several MySQL processes running from single box, but you can solve it with the proper scripts. And another problem to keep in mind is the capacity that's available on Flash. Obviously, you should have enough space to put several databases. Thanks a lot, Vadim. Um, actually, uh, on this uh, last slide of putting in multiple instances, uh, we will also see a use case at the end of the presentation where customers have truly consolidated four instances of MySQL on a single PCIe SSD card from uh, Virident. And, and, and that is a situation, Vadim, where we do offer the capacity, the performance, and they can do with less DRAM and be able to put more than okay. four instances. Excellent. So um, 
Sirish, you have had a lot of experience with customers who have truly worked with Flash in a MySQL environment, but can you walk through someone who has decided to use Flash for MySQL, can you walk them through the process on how would they go about evaluating Flash storage? As we all know, there are quite a few uh, Flash devices out there in the marketplace that talk about different levels of performance, etc. How does one determine this is the right flash storage for my application? And how does one determine or make sense out of all of these performance numbers that are being discussed in the market? Okay. Thank you, Sridhar. So uh, we have been you know, working on the MySQL and Flash for five plus years now. And uh, over, over the time, we have seen a lot of questions coming from customers because A, there are a lot of different types of Flash. And B, you know, the workload varies or they really want to know. There are some concerns about Flash. So the key concerns that we hear, I wanted to list them out. The very first one we hear is right performance degradation over time. Uh, most of you who have seen Flash have heard the stories that out of the box, the uh, drives look very good. And as soon as you start using them, you, know, you don't, don't really get the same performance that was claimed. So we will talk a lot about that. The second is uh, something Baron had mentioned, that how do you really size how many IOPS do you really need in production? And the recommendation would be do not go for the average IOPS even if you're trying to consolidate. Uh, Baron had mentioned nicely that what you want to shoot for is you know, the peak performance you're going to get. Uh, if you're a retailer, you're looking for you know, the workload you're going to get during Christmas or, or that season or any other peak performance, plus you need to look at the minimum IOPS a drive can deliver. Uh, do not go by average numbers, either on the drive side or on your load side when you match these together. Uh, the third one, briefly I wanted to mention, was about the flash storage lifetime. And this is more relevant if people are choosing MLC versus SLC, uh, because MLC drives, though they are cheaper, have less lifetime. Uh, so you definitely want to ask your flash vendor how much lifetime is guaranteed on the flash and how do you really know how much of it are you using. Most of the time it should be given in form of the right to over lifetime of card and there should be some tool that you can see you know, how much life you're using. And then you want to calculate how many writes your MySQL database does. And that should include not only your database write, but the double write buffer, the log write, and the backups, and all other activities you're going to do on the drive. And extrapolate that to the life you are expecting on the server. And the fourth most important one is power loss protection. There are some SSD drives, they actually use DRAM, but do not have power protection like capacitor backend. Uh, and you're used to that through your RAID controller, so don't give that up when you're choosing a flash. So let's talk a little bit more on performance variability. Uh, so this is a benchmark uh, Vadim had done uh, on TPCC. And what it shows is as you increase the load, some of the drives can have more variability than the other. And this will definitely affect you because what you're looking for is the lowest throughput that you can get from the drive so you can size it accordingly. So let's see why this happens. So the main cause of performance variability is because uh, you know the flash fundamentally you know has asymmetry in reads and writes. The reads on a NAND flash are in microseconds, you know, hundred microseconds or less, but the writes are in milliseconds. Uh, and then we talked about this erase that you need to do on a large area of flash in order to write on it. It's not a write in place medium. So a controller which is trying to schedule reads, writes, and erase on a flash actually has to juggle to make sure the reads are not blocked behind writes or erases. And that is no simple task. And, and that's where most of the drives you know, are getting differentiated because if you have a stronger controller which really can do a look ahead in the queue, can arrange the reads and writes better, it can guarantee steady performance. The drive has to be designed with steady performance in mind and not simply to give you the highest throughput. So let me walk you through what you will really see in the life of a flash. 
Uh, on the left side, so the x-axis is more of a timeline of the device, the y-axis is the performance. And when you buy a flash or when you look at a data sheet, what you really see is an out-of-the-box number that a vendor will describe, right? So they will give you a peak bandwidth number of reads and a peak write number. What that is is usually a very large block sequential I.O. or a random I.O., but it is 128K box, right? So 100% read, 100% write number looks very good, you know, few hundred megabytes per second. But that's probably not very relevant to your MySQL workflow. Then you will also have a number for IOPS, which will be, you know, 100% read, 4K IOPS and write. Again, these are not mixed IOPS. So now if you start using the drive, what you'll see is when you put a mixed read-write workload, you will see fluctuations and lower performance. And finally, when the drive is in production for a while, it is going to get into the garbage collection mode where it has to do erases in the background. You are going to get bad blocks, which is a constant thing about flash. And the flash controller has to relocate all the flash around time to time. So that is going to cause a huge amount of variability. So what we came up with is a benchmark called SSC Bench 2 uh, that will really help you choose the drive. Uh, so in our terminology, SSD Bench 1 is a benchmark a vendor gives you to measure the specified peak performance, and that's very easy to do. The SSD Bench 2 benchmark actually is going to put the drive in the garbage collection mode on and do sustained performance on it on various block sizes. So I'm going to talk uh, briefly about you know what you will get out of the benchmark. And later on in the slide, you will see a link where you can download this benchmark and you know, run it for yourself when you're choosing a drive. So let's look at this chart. Uh, again, there are two drives we looked at. And what we are doing here is a random workload of 4K, uh, a mixed workload. And you will see that some drives have a lot more fluctuation than the other plus many times the IOPS are hitting zero. We definitely don't want that. Now, this second chart, which comes out of the same benchmark, shows read IOPS at various different block sizes when the drive is in garbage collection and used fully. The third chart showcases read latencies, which is another important factor for you to look at. And what you want to see is as you load more and more I.O., as more and more users are hitting your MySQL and more queries are happening, you are going to see a lot of random you know, multi-thread I.O. happening from MySQL. And you want a steady performance from the drive. So the latencies should not go higher even when there are 16 or 32 outstanding I.O. And, okay. So, so Sirish, I think that is a very good explanation of SSD Bench 2, but that still does the benchmark at the IOPS and uh, at, at different block sizes. Is there a way uh, one could do the benchmarks at the application level? Uh, can you talk a little bit about the SSD Bench 3? Okay, good. Yeah, so, you know, so the other concern we used to have from customers is the SSD Bench 2 actually gives numbers which are in IOPS and latencies and how do they correlate with an application that they're going to use. And many times, a customer is going to buy SSD for not just MySQL workload, but varying workload. So how do they really know that this one drive can satisfy all their application workload? So we developed a benchmark called SSD Bench 3. Again, this is going to be a GPL open source benchmark for you guys to look at. Uh, but what this does is collect seven different application workloads uh, and when you run this, you would know that the drive should do good in all the workloads. So let me just quickly go through what the workloads are. So you have the, your analytics workload, a big block I.O., you have a checkpointing, which is uh, you know dumping your DRAM memory on at random write. You have database simulation, which is simulating Oracle workload. You have high frequency trading, a specific benchmark we got from you know the bank. Uh, and you have metadata file operation, where you're doing a lot of create a file or delete a file or stack on a file using IOZone. And the last one, which I really like, is InnoSim, written, written by Mark uh, Callahan uh, at Facebook. Uh, 
and this not only takes the IO coming, simulates the IO coming from InnoDB, but it also gives you options to, you know, enable bin logs and transaction logs and double write buffers and so on. So we use all these benchmarks and let me show you a sample output of this. So what we have done is relatively compared the, you know, three different drives. Uh, but what you want is stay between the 90 to 100 percent. You want a drive which stays best in all the workloads. So you don't really have to worry, you know, which drive should I pick if my workload changes. Okay, so this is the link uh, for the benchmark and you should be able to download this, uh, you know, anytime. If you have questions, definitely write to support at this. Thank you, Sirish. Uh, hopefully this has given uh, the audience a very good view on how they can determine what is the right performance level that their I.O. subsystem would give in their application environment. I'm just going to uh, spend a few minutes on uh, a use case that we had a few months back um, and also walk through the benefits that this customer got by deploying the Viridian PCIe SSD devices. The, this is a, a Web2.0 company, a social blog hosting site, and uh, using MySQL as a core database uh, for their operations. Before uh, they, they put in the, the Viridian FlashMax PCIe SSD devices, they had a lot of servers with direct attached mechanical drives and the data being hosted on these servers. This was a typical master slave, a slave configuration uh, for MySQL. And once they put in the Viridian FlashMax devices, actually they got two key benefits out of uh, alleviating the I.O. bottlenecks. The first one was they were able to support 4x the amount of I.O. traffic on a single device. And uh, it gave them a significant boost in performance up to about 4x. The second thing, what they found out was that uh, because of the amount of performance that the Veridian FlashMax device actually delivers, they were able to consolidate and put four instances of MySQL onto a single server. So this way they were able to consolidate the number of servers, thereby um, uh, I mean, getting a significant saving in terms of the uh, server costs as well as space and, and power and cooling. So net-net, the benefit that they saw out of implementing storage based on uh, Viridian FlashMax uh, PCIe SSDs was close to 16x uh, over their existing infrastructure. This also gave them significant headroom whereby they could accommodate a lot higher user growth rate uh, in terms of traffic as well as the data being posted on these machines. Uh, we, uh, I wanted to thank the panelists and we would like to uh, end the the, the, the uh, slide deck here and we'd like to open it up for questions. Actually, we already have quite a few questions here and I'm just going to walk through each one of them and uh, give it to the panelists and the panelists will address these questions. So so the first question goes to Vadim. Uh, Vadim, one of the questions is what is the default block size on XFS and is XFS better than the other power systems for MySQL? Uh, yes, I can answer that. Well, the first one is easy. Default block size for XFS is 5, uh, 12 bytes. And uh, is XFS better than other file system? Uh, traditionally, we recommend to use XFS because it shows better performance. And especially back to uh, years when uh, default file system was XT3 for uh, Linux server. Uh, but in uh, my recent research, ex actually XT4 shows quite good results, and especially uh, in uh, asynchronous mode. And asynchronous mode is the uh, default mode for MySQL and the Percona server 5.5. And actually in uh, asynchronous mode, XT4 shows better results than EXFS. So let me add a little bit to Vadim. Uh, so in our analysis, what we have seen is uh, ext3 and 4 actually has a file level lock. So if you are opening a single file and multiple threads are writing to it, only one thread can write at the same time. XFS does not have the problem. So one way to go around it is use you know file per table. Don't use a large IB data one file if you have multiple writers writing on it. Yeah, 
three, that's correct, but uh, again, asynchronous mode removes this problem. You, you don't have the problem in asynchronous mode. Okay. Thank you, Vadim and Sirish. The uh, next question, uh, I'd like to direct that to both Baron and Vadim. Can you talk about memory sizing for the InnoDB buffer pool with 300 gigabytes of data on a one terabyte Viridian card? So, Baron, if you could answer that, that would be great. So, uh, uh, okay, I, I, I will uh, answer that. So, uh, uh, again, uh, for for me, uh, there there is no such thing like enough memory. The memory, the more memory you have, the better. But you actually should be carefully to not put too much memory. I mean, if your uh, data only 100 gig, you probably do not need more than 100 gig of uh, uh, memory. And uh, uh, addressing uh, another question, how to find if uh, uh, you have uh, I.O. workload or a memory workload, you actually uh, when you run your application, you will see I.O. on the operation system level and you have if you have a lot of uh, read IOs, that means you have a lot of uh, operation on disk and probably you have not enough memory. Okay. So, Baron, would you like to add something to that? I think Baron was muted the last time around. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry that I was muted. Um, there is something that I wanted to add uh, to what Vadim said. We've also done some scalability testing on MySQL and InnoDB to discover how it, uh, what its scalability characteristics are as you give it more and more memory. And we found that it doesn't. It, it does like uh, most systems. It starts to decrease um, the larger that you get it, the, the performance return on investment. So there is kind of a sweet spot for how much memory you give MySQL. Um, it can certainly function quite well with very large uh, amounts of memory installed in the server, but it may be more ec economical at that point to consider um, running several instances on a machine and uh, consolidating several instances, giving each of them a portion of the server's memory. And we have some, work, some uh, white papers on Percona's website that explain that research in more detail. Okay. Um, the, the, the next question is, um, how about using InnoDB compression to fit all my data in Flash? Uh, uh, okay, in my uh, research, actually, InnoDB compression uh, does not perform uh, that well. It does not perform well from a performance standpoint. Uh, actually, it introduces even more uh, internal locking and the contention than InnoDB without compression. And uh, uh, another point is that InnoDB compression does not give you that good uh, compression factor. Actually, there is some work uh, done by uh, my skill team at Facebook. They especially improve InnoDB compression uh, to be useful. And they, they especially do it to feed more data into Flash. So if you're interested in that, you might take a look on, on that work. But by uh, a default configuration in MySQL and Percona server, I probably would not be looking for using an ADB compression. Okay. Thank you, Vadim. Um, we do have quite a few questions. We'll try to address all of them and maybe uh, spend a few more minutes uh, extra on the webinar if uh, you would like to. But the next question is, uh, directed towards Veridin, um, do you have uh, disk RAID 1 or do you build the disk RAID 1, 5, or 10? Uh, my understanding of the question is do we have any form of redundancy on our PCIe SSDs? We do have actually a flash away RAID that is built onto the card. Uh, this is similar to RAID 5 and what this enables uh, is that even in the event of uh, a flash module die or a chip failure, it does not impact the data availability to the end user. So net-net, uh, uh, what I would like to say is that we do have a flash aware RAID and that is one of the enterprise class reliability features that we have built on this particular device. And this ensures very high data availability to the end user. 
There is another question that is related to that, which says, what about redundancy? SAM systems can give a good solution here. We, I mean, we at Veridem, we have also built um, an HA solution, one-to-one -one, uh, replication across uh, two different machines using the open source DRVD uh, stack. And this uh, enables customers to uh, build the level of uh, redundancy that a SAM solution truly provides. So that combined with the RAID, combined with ECC that we have on the device gives very high levels of protection. Sirish, would you like to add something to that? And yeah, and to add to that, MySQL community usually prefers the master and slave replication, you know, or master and you know, secondary master, right? But so that is their preferred form of yes. The next question is, what are the benefits and cautions of adjusting the InnoDB page size to match the block size or be much larger, say 4K or 16K? Uh, okay, I, I can uh, uh, talk uh, about that. Uh, uh, yes, in the uh, Percona server, we have a uh, possibility to change uh, a block size to 4K and to 8K. And in some cases, actually, it shows uh, good benefits. But in some other cases, you actually have a worse results, and the worse result corresponds again to internal MDB locking in the contention, because the smaller page size you have, the more pages you have, and MDB has to perform operation with the least of pages. It may be done not that efficient. And saying that, I don't have. Uh, I don't have an exact recommendation how to uh, uh, diagnose if 4K or 16K is better for your workload. That's why I prefer to stay on the whole setting, setting which is 16K. Thank you, Vadim. Uh, the next question is, uh, I think Baron uh, answered part of this question as a response to a previous one, but let me ask that question again. Isn't adding more memory uh, couldn't that cause a problem with MySQL slash Percona 5.1? It is true that newer versions of the server are definitely improved with regards to um, scalability of the buffer pool. So the buffer pool scalability is a hot topic in InnoDB and has been for many years. Percona server's um, response to the, the uh, global bottlenecks, essentially, is what we were dealing with inside of InnoDB's buffer pool was to take a single mutex, which is a, a variable that protects um, memory when there's concurrent access to it, and to split that into many smaller mutexes, uh, reducing the contention on the single mutex. And uh, when MySQL 5.5 was released, the, uh, they took a different approach. The official MySQL approach there was actually to partition the buffer pool, which is uh, kind of the classic um, tried and true approach to improving scalability of a system like that. Um, so the best of both worlds is really to do both, to partition the buffer pool into smaller buffer pool instances, and then to take the global mutexes on each of those smaller instances and split them up into many smaller mutexes, um, or into mutexes that protect smaller regions of the server's memory. And that's the approach that you can find in Percona Server 5.5 today. And I expect that we'll make further improvements. And indeed, the InnoDB team is working very hard on scalability and performance of InnoDB as well. So um, the, the takeaway here, I would say, is that newer versions of InnoDB are significantly better than older ones. Thanks, Barry. Uh, the uh, next question, I think, is directed to Vadim. Are there any specific performance settings to tweak when using flash cache with SSD? Or are the settings you presented earlier the same when using only SSD without flash cache? Uh, actually, it, it, it is a very big question. I am not sure if I able to answer to that in a couple of minutes. By default, you should be good with the running settings I presented, but flash cache may be quite uh, complicated and might require a uh, good amount of uh, additional research. Thank you, Vadim. If there is enough interest in flash cache uh, working with uh, SSDs, this could be a topic of a future webinar. Uh, 
there is one other question. Is B cash better than flash cash? Again, I would direct this to the team. Uh, I don't have experience with the B cash, and uh, the, my problem is that I'm usually running uh, the system that uh, my customers are running, and right now it is Red Hat, Red Hat five or six, and as I know, B cash is not available on uh, this system. That's why. I cannot uh, give a good recommendation for a okay. Um Unfortunately, we are running out of time. There are quite a few other questions on the list, and we'll try to send out a response to the attendees uh, and try to address their questions. Um, we would like to thank all of you for attending uh, this webinar, uh, jointly hosted by Percona and Veridan Systems. I would also like to thank the uh, panelists, Baron Schwartz, Vadim and Sirish uh, from Viridet. Thank, uh, thank you again for joining and we should have the presentation posted on uh, the Viridan site as well as on the Percona site and we will also have the benchmarks. The benchmarks are already on the Viridan site so if you would like to download them and evaluate the performance of SSDs, uh, please do so.